All right, the Old Testament lesson today, it's uh, this uh, one of the passages in the book of the prophet Isaiah that's a background to this idea of blindness and spiritual sight is um, from Isaiah chapter 42. So uh, let's read it together. For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Hear you deaf, look you blind and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. So, um, Starts for a long time, I've kept silent, so kind of a thinking question. Have you ever gotten silent treatment from somebody? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. It would last about three days. Oh, my. Oh, wow. That's persistent. And then I would get a coffee. All that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would get a coffee again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it often happens in relationships sometimes, uh, in families, you know. Um, Jerry and I were just talking about one of our <coughs> members in our first congregation, Gussie Strelo, who had uh, cancer, and uh, her sister's name was Ernestine, Ernestine, and uh, um, something had happened between these sisters. They were both like in their 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Gussie was uh, the uh, cook at Camp Luismo for many, many years. Uh, hmm? Cookie. So she's just a sweetheart. But something happened, and um, her sister was the same one who stopped coming to church for a while when I grew up here. So it tells you something about, <laughs> about her sister and, and tried to convince me that, that Jesus and nobody else in the Bible ever had beards. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> but something had happened, and her sister never talked to her. They, they came to church every Sunday, they sat in the pews. Every Sunday, when I got there, there was only one service, so they had to come to the same service. Later on, there were two, so I mean, you could come to a different one, but um, but they never talked. Her sister refused to talk, and and when Gussie got uh, cancer, and it was pretty significant, and you know, this is the early, really early 80s, um, when I, my first parish, and, and chemo treatment back there was a little bit different than it is today. Um, I mean, it's still hard, but it's much more targeted. Back then, it was like uh, you know a scatter gun. We're just going to throw everything at you and hope that the cancer dies, kind of thing, you know, rather than being targeted for a particular kind of cancer. So it was tough. It was tough. If you had that kind of treatment, it wasn't outpatient treatment. It was inpatient sometimes for two or three days. They didn't have all the anti-nausea stuff that they have now to help deal with those kind of side effects. And, and despite how sick her sister was, Ernestine would ask me, how's my sister doing? Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to her, seriously, why don't you go ask her? Whatever happened in the past, and they never told me, why don't you go ask her? You know? That was a long time. When I think about silent treatments, that's the mother of all silent treatments, yeah. I think, that I've experienced in relationships. But, um, Did they ever talk to each other? Um, not that I'm aware. Wow. Um, 
Not that I'm aware. I think Ernestine actually, I want to say she died before her sister. Sister. The other thing I remember about Gus, and this is always a reminder that sometimes we don't know. We think we know what we would do, but we don't know until we're in it. I remember her saying as she had watched other people go through cancer treatment, if I get cancer, I'll never do that. And of course, then she got cancer, and then it would sign me up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's always the difficult things about um, when you ask a what if question. Mm -hmm. Because you might think, well, this is the way I'm going to react, but then when you're there, you find out you react very differently. You think you would make this choice, but instead you make this choice when you're in that situation. Um, so God has been um, silent. Why do people give the silent treatment? What are some possible reasons? <laughs> Sometimes it's the... Um good thing to do because it gives you time to think about what you want to say before you blur something else you shouldn't. So count to ten before you... <laughs> right. So yeah. sometimes giving a little silent time helps to calm a situation down so you can speak more clearly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, some of, I was, you're angry with the person. You probably noticed that that is sort of the silent type. So he doesn't notice when <laughs> See, and I, I know in my relationship with Terry, I'm, I, I'm silent, and it took a while for me to tell her I'm not silent because I'm mad or upset. I just got to think about this before I talk. Yeah, he's a processor. I'm a processor, and so I got to run it through my brain. I got to talk about it out loud while I'm caught in a lawn. I got to do, you know, it's just, it's the way that I process um, feelings, emotions, thoughts, and, um, and so it takes a little time for me to put together what I want to say and how I want to say it. Um, Sometimes you're silent too because you don't want to hear what the other person has to say back to you either. <laughs> so if you don't ever start the conversation, you don't get the response. <laughs> what are some good reasons to be silent? For what? For a bit. Anyway. For a bit, anyway. Um, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when I was thinking about was uh, helicopter parents. Mm. That sometimes you got to let your kids fail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and let them figure it out instead of trying to figure it out for them. You can guide them, you can be there, but sometimes, you know. Where it'd be really easy, I think that's true in, in many relationships, you want to step in and you want to say, well, here's what you should do. Sometimes you got to let them figure it out. I mean, if they ask you for advice, you can give advice, you can give them options, you can do those kind of things, but, but you don't fix it for them, which sometimes we're prone to do. Sometimes it's a... Uh, um, you made your bed, now you lie in it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Experience the consequences of your behavior. Again, not, that's not necessarily guiding them to get out of it. That's just helping, stepping back and saying, okay, I'm going to let them feel. Um, I use another example from the first congregation. It was a, a mom that I knew real well. The, um, she had a son and a daughter, a daughter we knew very well. The son was always in and out of trouble, often in and out of trouble with the lawn. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation with her saying, you know, she's expressing her frustration. And I said, well, what do you do when he gets in trouble? Um, well, she said he's been arrested and put in jail a number of times. So what do you do? I bail him out. I said, well, <laughs> maybe you need to let him sit. You know, the next time it happened, she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I just want you to know I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. oh. And she bailed him out again. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, she couldn't do it. And um, 
and she wasn't doing him any favors by bailing him out. I tried to explain to her, you know, he's going to have a roof over his head, he's going to have three square meals a day, <laughs> he's not going to be drinking at the bar or doing marijuana or anything like that. He's, he's, he's safe, you know, and he might learn something in the process. It's experiencing Consequences. Well, God starts this particular passage for a long time. I've kept silent. I've been quiet and held myself back. Again, that makes me think about a parent who wants to jump in and fix something right away rather than I got to figure it out. But now, like a woman, those are interesting words because so often God's love is compared to that of a man. But there are a number of places in the Bible where he compares himself to the love of a mother or of a woman. And this, usually it's a mother. And, and, and here it's the, um, I can't wait to get this kid out of me. <laughs> <laughs> right kind of attitude. Um, so why in this context has God been silent? Well, we've got to look at the context a little bit. So here's where you need your Bibles. Um, if um, if we uh, if we think about Isaiah in the beginning, we're not going to jump there. But remember, this is the one that starts, you know, um, where Jesus, where God says to His people, uh, "Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow." That's from the very first chapters of Isaiah. And if you uh, if you jump back to um, uh, verse or chapter 40, the beginning of this uh, particular section of Isaiah. Isaiah is divided into three sections. Uh, the first one is uh, chapters 1 to 39. The second one starts in chapter 40. And um, uh, in this one, um, somebody want to read just verses 1 and 2 for us? 40? Yeah, chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, and that her sin has been paid for. That she has that she for paid for. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Okay, and so he said, "I'm I've allowed you to go through suffering," and then there's this um, uh, the the comfort passage here is. Um, um, is the good tidings that he brings in verse 9. Um, in verse uh, 11, um, just some very comforting words. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who are young. Um, and then the end of chapter um, 27, um, he says, uh, or at the end of chapter four, or 40, and verse 27, he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? And then comes those very famous words that uh, the hymn on eagle's wings is uh, built. And, and what he's saying to them is, Yes, um, I've been silent, but I've been watching. I've been watching. And, um, and so in, in chapter 41, he becomes the helper. Um, and he says, I'm going to answer. And in chapter 42, we've got the beginning of the servant songs. And so this actually picks up in the middle of the very first of what are called the four servant songs in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Um, so would somebody read for us the beginning, the, the, Let's start with just verses 1 to 4. We'll kind of make our way through it up to the text. Here is my servant whom I hold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth, uh, justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hold. Okay, so you, you've got this uh, description of the servant. Now the question is, who's the servant? 
Um, we're going to answer that in a couple of ways, but if you go back to chapter 41, uh, would somebody read verses 8 to 10? Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with your righteousness with my righteous right hand. So who's the servant here? It's Jacob. the Israelites, yeah. right? right? It's the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, now this becomes, a, and what we're just thinking about here is this becomes a little bit of a challenge because when you get to Isaiah 53, is it talking about the servant Israel or is it talking about Jesus? What's the answer to that question? Oh. Yes. Yes, it's talking about both. Jesus is uh, the embodiment of Israel. Now, how can you say he's going to bring the hope to, uh, through Israel? Well, where's the Messiah coming from? From God's people. So you can say Israel's going to bring salvation, and you can say Jesus brought salvation. You're saying the same thing um, because Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. And, and you can uh, see that if um, somebody read verses 5 to 7 for us of chapter 42. We're still in the Suffering Servant Song. Chapter 42. What was it again? 5 to, five to 7. Pick up where. This is what the, the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have To open the eyes that are blind. So I was kind of curious why they just chose the little portion that's here, but this whole section talks a little bit about this concept of blindness in the Old Testament. Um, and this promise that, that this servant would be a covenant for the people. And one of the things that, uh, that especially Isaiah emphasizes is that Israel wasn't just supposed to be about Israel, therefore the world. A light for the world. A light for the Gentiles so that his name would be proclaimed in all the world. Um, and uh, then this imagery of opening the eyes of the blind, freeing captives from prison, release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness, which can be taken both physically and spiritually. God is going to release people who are captive physically. Um, and so it's in this context that you have the, the passage uh, that we have for the Old Testament lesson, lesson uh, come, come up. Um, and of course you especially have the idea of blindness in verse 16. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known among unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. And in verse 18, hear you deaf, look you blind, and see who is blind but my servant. So here he calls his servant Israel blind. Now, all of this is background for Jesus. What does he say when the Pharisees ask, are we blind too? Jesus says, yeah, <laughs> you are. Just like your father's before you. And, and so it's in that context that they would understand this kind of, um, of blindness. It's um, not something Jesus is making up, but he leans back on these old passages from the Old Testament about the blindness of, of, of God, of God's people. 
Now, this is just the first of four sermon songs, so let's just get a quick flavor for those. So if you turn to the other ones, the second one is in Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6. And it's got much the same picture. Somebody want to read those six verses for us? 49, 1 to 6. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. Before my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. But now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So now we've got um, a servant. Now why can't, here's a place where um, we would say, He's already moved beyond the nation of Israel to the person of Jesus. Why? What in the text of this says, well, it can't be the whole nation of Israel that he's talking about anymore. For me and my in the womb to be his servant? Well, you could say, well, he knew Abraham before Abraham existed, Moses before Moses existed. He says that about a number of the prophets like Jeremiah. Well, it's the light to the Gentiles, but he's already said that about Israel in the first passage. Because he's using a singular. What about restoring? He's, he's restoring. Oh. Who's he restoring? The tribes of Jacob. They're, so this servant has a mission to Israel. It's not Israel that has a mission to itself. Mm -hmm. But now somebody else has got a mission to bring back Israel. So Israel can't be the servant here. It's got to be somebody else. And, and this is why the, the idea of the servant of, of God moves from Israel to Jesus. And then if you go to the next one, which is in chapter 50, <coughs> it's verses 4 to 9. This is what the Lord says, where is your mother's certificate of divorce? With which, that's 50, right? 50 verses, starting with verse 4, yeah. The Sovereign Lord has given four. me an instructive that's, that's tongue. Four. Uh, the Sovereign Lord has given me an instructive tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offer my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting, because the sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, and he who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. This is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. Moths will eat them up. Do you hear echoes of New Testament passages there? Yeah. Where do you hear echoes of New Testament passages there? The mocking and the spitting. He sets his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I love that passage. It's right after the uh, transfiguration. I 
think it's in Luke's account, and then it says he set his face toward Jerusalem. In other words, now he knows he's headed. How do you know this is in Israel? Because it says, I have not been rebellious. <laughs> And if you were to read all of the book of the prophet Isaiah, you know that uh, back in the early chapters, he details the rebellions of both Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdom. Um, you also hear echoes of Paul's uh, letter to the Romans, especially in that one, is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he? Who can condemn? Who can, who can accuse me? The devil can't speak to me. That's what Satan means as accuser. The devil cannot accuse me of anything because Jesus has paid for it all. And, and so um, Paul can say, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Because God's chosen us in Christ Jesus. And, and so there's no charges that'll stick. Reagan was a Teflon president. We're Teflon people now. Coated with the righteousness of Jesus. And, and so he, he points to the fact that he's going to stand even when everything else disappears. Okay? Then um, the last one, of course, is probably the one we're most familiar with, which is the one that starts in chapter 52, verse 13. And we're not going to read that whole section. We do it usually on Good Friday, um, somewhere around there, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Um, I usually alternate for an Old Testament lesson, this lesson from Isaiah 52 through 53, and, or um, the Messianic Psalm, uh, Psalm um, 22, which is the one that depicts Jesus on the cross and casting lots for his clothes and all of that. Um, uh, but here you've got specifically um, the picture now that the Lord is laying on this servant our iniquity, our punishment. Um, and this servant, even though he dies, is going to see in verse 11 the, of chapter 53, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So the, the picture becomes more and more complete of who this servant is in moving from the nation of Israel, which failed as God's servant, to the one who's going to have a mission to and for Israel to redeem them and ransom them and bring them back uh, to God. So this serving could be both Israel and Jesus at the same time. Is it Israel or is it Jesus? And the answer is yes. But there's a transition here. Um, and you see this transition in a number of different places. I've already uh, previously mentioned the whole temple thing. You know, the temple was a building and then it's the body of Jesus and now it's the body of Christ or the church in the world. It's that kind of transitionary thinking um, that helps us understand uh, how Isaiah is moving us through this concept. Now, if you go back to chapter 42, at the very beginning of the chapter, it's not in our text, but it's the beginning of the sermon song. Chapter 42, verse 1. Somebody want to read that verse for us again? Okay, now the question is, where do you find these kind of words reflected in the New Testament? When Jesus said in the temple, um, holy and well, at his baptism, right? The Spirit descends on him. So if you're a first century Jew and you see what happened and you hear the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, in whom I am 
Well, please listen to him. Both though the father spoke words that are reflective of this text, both at his baptism and at the transfiguration. And um, I didn't have this one in here. I'm going to go there. Here we go. In Matthew chapter 12, um, if you go here, there, you'll see that these words are specifically. Are used of Jesus, applied to Jesus. And so this is the understanding of um, Matthew. Remember, Matthew's writing for Jews, so he quotes the Old Testament and alludes to the Old Testament more than any other gospel writer. Um, but you can see in, in, um, in chapter 12, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, something that... Uh, he demonstrates also by healing the blind men on the Sabbath day, but uh, the Pharisees were plotting to kill Jesus, if you go down to verse 14 of chapter 12, and then it says, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him and healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one in whom I delight. And so he quotes, um, Isaiah chapter 42, it applies it directly to Jesus. So you've got it at the baptism, you've got it at the transfiguration, you've got a fuller quote here in Matthew chapter 12. But then, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, verse 47. Acts 13. Verse 47, so the end of the, and um, we'll start with, um, somebody want to back up to verse 44 and read through verse 48. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We have to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, you now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So Paul applies it to the Christian mission. And, and it's in this context that we'd also understand Jesus saying to, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. You know, light shouldn't be hidden under a bushel. Mm -hmm. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so this kind of completes the person. Uh, who's the servant of God now? It's the new Israel are Christians. So you're moving from uh, this idea of Israel as a servant of God to, the, to, to us being servants of God. Now, um, a question. Yeah, go ahead. I find it interesting that a lot of these, they talk about the way, and the early Christians were called the way. The way. So I thought that was kind of an interesting transition to is what they were labeled before they were called Christians. Before they were called Christians, yeah. And actually, they were first called Christians by people who were not Christian. Christian. It's just like Lutherans were first called Lutherans by people who were not Lutheran. You know, so originally it was um, a term applied by somebody who was not in your favor. Mm -hmm. um, Luther himself didn't particularly care for the word Lutheran. He preferred the word evangelical um, from the word evangel or evangel, which means uh, gospel preaching, 
gospel proclaiming. Um, so the next question is kind of as Israel was blind back here, where sometimes are we blind in our own walk with God? The next question I didn't just I didn't eradicate from last week. So um, no, where 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 do we struggle with blindness sometimes? Yeah, I think it's one way is that we just don't see the people who are there. Don't notice. I had a good don't notice moment the other day. Um, Linda Cannell came in because she's teaching. So Lenore is teaching for Suzanne Denicky down in 4K and she asked Linda to come in and teach music a couple of days a week with her class. And she came in and she said, well, I want to take them up to the organ and show them the pipes. She said, is the door locked? I said, there's no door. <laughs> she said, well, you, I'm pretty sure there is. I said, there's no door. She said, well, is it closed and locked? I said, I don't know. I, I mean, I've been a pastor here for 10 years the first time and now uh, about three years this time. I never noticed that door. There is a door. It used to be locked regularly. It used to be locked? Uh -huh. well, I, 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 well, it was... It had to be locked when you were here the first time. Huh? It had to be locked when you were here the first No, I don't ever recall that door ever being closed or locked. Wow. Or a door. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a door there. I don't, I don't remember any time that I ever saw that door shut. Oh boy, this just makes me feel crazy. <laughs> Do you remember the door, Jerry? Do you remember the door? No, I'm just saying in the whole rest of life. Yeah, there you go. I've noticed. It's not just me. I told the ladies in the office, I'm a guy. I just don't know. Yeah. So, okay. How many times have I gone in? You know, I said I go up there multiple times during the week, you know, yeah. to load stuff on and that kind of stuff. And I've never noticed that stupid door. <laughs> you know? There's no cheese in the refrigerator. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the phrase in our house is it's behind the mayonnaise. You have to actually move something. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> He's trying to tell yeah. me what I need to buy. Yeah. I was actually amazed to see that last week. Open the drawer. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm amazed yeah. to see what it's for. Years. He said he was amazed that it was even open. Right, because yeah. it was locked for six months. Did Chuck? Yeah. I don't remember yeah. recall Ken Koshy locking it, and I don't recall oh. Chuck having it closed when we were in here. Well, see, I remember it because. <laughs> See when when Linda Canal when the Canals were, were when he was choir director yeah. and all that years and years and years ago and I would bring Caleb up when he was just a kid you know when he played with his cars or whatever he'd sit at my feet while I was in choir and she always had this big thing about I got to show you the organ pipes so that's why I knew the organ I knew about the door because I walked back with her so she could show Caleb. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's doors back by the, you know, in and around the, the pipes, but I didn't realize there was a door actually to the balcony. So, you know, yeah. learn something the wrong with the stairs. There you go. Yeah. We are talking about the top of the, the stairs. Top of the stairs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and say hi to me. Well, I didn't hear you, or see you, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's just realizing that sometimes, um, I find that sometimes in reading the Bible, I always remember the, my, my dear um, instructor in Greek and Latin, Charlie Freilich, who would say, reading the Bible in English is like driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour. Reading it in Greek is like taking a stroll down a wooded path and bending to notice every flower. Because you're reading it in another language, it forces you to notice things that otherwise you wouldn't notice. And, um, and sometimes in the busyness of life, we just pass by both people and things that we ought to pay some attention to. How many times have you like gone somewhere that's halfway between where you, like let's say between here and your house, mm -hmm. and you're going somewhere over there, and all of a sudden you find your way most of the way here before you remember, no, I was supposed to I'm stop supposed to way back that. there. <laughs> you're, you're, you're on automatic. You're on automatic. You're on automatic. I, I mean, that was one of the things that used to scare me about working in Brookfield. I'd be like, get out there and I'm like, holy crud, I don't remember how I got here. <laughs> I don't remember anything about my trip here. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, you just are so focused. And, and, and here the blindness so often that Jesus is talking about is a blindness to sin. You know, have you ever had a situation where you hurt somebody but you didn't know you hurt them? You said something that was hurtful but you didn't know it was hurtful when you said it or that somebody would take it that way and you maybe didn't even intend it. Or sometimes you think you're right, right? And then you find out you were wrong. And you were so vociferous about being right. Um, or what I find uh, um, is that with the Bible, we have a tendency to have selective um, both memory and application. So I. I, I still remember having a discussion with a particular person here um, when I was here the first time who wanted to put a sign over the entryway to the sanctuary, um, be still and know that I am God, because he was upset with the noise that the kids made. I said, as long as you put right next to it, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And let the little children come to me. And I, you know, you could add a whole bunch more, but you know, and um, my advice to people who don't like kids making noise is, um, go to a church that's dead, because you're not going to have any noise from children. Mm -hmm. You know. The only thing that got me was in the the cry room or whatever you want to call yep. it. Is I wanted to go in there when my kids were little so I could nurse and there are these old people sitting on the rock yeah. and I go in there and they would frown at me yep, yep. and I said that's what this room is for is for me to go in here and have some privacy right, right. you know and yet they had to sit there because it was quiet and they could turn up the, that they could turn up the, yep. the sound <laughs> and everything you know but, couldn't bring their easy chair culture a moment they could sit one there right <laughs> No, it's, it's just realizing that sometimes we are also blind. We are blind to uh, the, the attitudes and behaviors that we have that can be hurtful to others, and we don't even realize it. Um, and, and so I think the scriptures are a constant reminder to us in, in this particular lesson that God is calling us to be his servant, to be his light in the world, and to be aware of the blindness that we might have in our own hearts and lives that needs to be removed so that we can be that light. Um, obviously, the people in this Acts 37 text were pretty blind because instead of being happy about having the whole city together to hear the word of the Lord, they were, it says, both jealous and then they talked abusively. And how often haven't you heard that sometimes um, among Christians because sometimes maybe somebody didn't worship exactly the same way 
that you did, did not use the same instruments, did not use sing the same kind of songs. And, and there's a superiority. Well, our way is better than your way, is it? Well, they didn't have organs back then, and now we're using an organ, so you could say that you shouldn't use organs. And I think the Russian and the Greek churches, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Orthodox ones don't use any of that. All they ever do is chants and Sing a acapella. acapella because that wasn't in the early church. So why are we bringing all this stuff in from, you know? So you just opened a segue for me to mention a Bible passage Jerry was reading the other day. Because <laughs> she's reading through the Bible and she's in the book of Daniel. And, so, and she hasn't known her Bible because she knows that I said this really honest. The first time pipes are used in the Bible, they were played so that people would bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. They were used oh, yeah. in pagan worship. I used to always tell Ken Koshi this. <laughs> yeah, but those are the same kind of pipes. I missed one. They were used, so remember Nebuchadnezzar told the whole kingdom, when you hear the pipes, and then there's a few other instruments, but when you hear the pipes, which have been like a pan flute, but it'd be like a, it's like a pipe that's powered by air, only it's your own air. It's the first time pipes are mentioned in the Bible. That kind of uh, I thought you said pets. no <laughs> pipes and and uh, and the first time they're used is for pagan worship. So I used to tell Ken, "You're playing the devil's instrument." <laughs> and if you know the history of organs in Christian worship, they weren't introduced until um, just over a thousand A.D. Uh, didn't become prevalent until about twelve hundred A.D. Where were they used before that? They existed before that. They were used in the Colosseum for entertainment. Is that why they were in baseball? A, baseball. An emperor, <laughs> the history of the organ in Christian churches goes back to an, uh, an emperor who gave the Pope a pipe organ in back around 1000 AD. That Pope, I can't remember his name, he liked it so much that he set a bunch of the uh, monasteries about the business of making pipe organs, and they started to be distributed then throughout Europe. That's how pipe organ music got into the church. And not until about 1000 AD. So again, you know, yeah, that might be the way we do it now, but sometimes we have a his, we, um, Peter Kreef used to call this something like uh, historic uh, amnesia, and, uh, uh, and modern superiority. We think the people back then didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Or that they did it all wrong. We do it so much better than they did, you know? Well, we don't know, we weren't there. We weren't there. And, and yet, when you think about the seven wonders of the world, they just found another chain, um, the place in the Great Sphinx in Egypt. You know, they opened up another chamber, didn't know it was there. Um, we don't have a clue how they built that thing or how it was designed. And some of the great wonders of the world go to the cathedrals in Europe and you're looking at it saying, how in the world did they put this together? Uh -huh. you know? It's huge. <laughs> and they didn't have the big cranes that we have that dot our downtowns, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah, so it, it's, it's just a reminder that we have to be careful about our own blindness when it comes to uh, those kind of issues, attitudes, and behaviors. Okay, we're going to skip the epistle, but we're going to jump to the gospel. Um, even though I preached on it last night, I'm going to preach on it this week, uh, but with a different slant. Um, but I, I, I just, uh, I really, really, really like this passage, so I don't mind preaching on it twice in a, in a week. In a week. <laughs> and just reminding that you can I always found that when people, when the Lutheran Hour was on, or people would listen to Mount Olive, you know, when they had their radio broadcast in the morning, or St. Paul's West Dallas had a radio broadcast of their service, and uh, people who would, uh, I actually have had people in uh, parish say, well, I've already heard two sermons this morning before I got here. One on Lutheran Hour, and then one on either St. Paul's or before I got here. And, and, and they'd say to me, it's interesting how you can hear a sermon on the same text and it comes out so different. Yes. Yeah. Except when I was at Concordia, they had a speaker 
to some politician. And so the, the, the graduation was on a Saturday, and my graduation for um, doctorate was on a Sunday. They had the same speaker. He gave the same speaking thing, only he switched the words from Catholic to, because I was at Cardinal's Church. Oh. He switched the words from, from a quote from Luther to from the Franciscan, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm sitting there and saying, this is identical. identical. <laughs> I didn't bother rewriting this at all. Just applying it in two different contexts. Yep. Um, all right, well, let's uh, take a look at uh, the passage. I'm not going to start by reading it this time so we can have the rest of our time for discussion because we're uh, it's a long text and I would want to read everything. Um, but we'll start this way. Describe an adventure you had with mud as a child or young adult. I got one. Got one? <laughs> so when Chuck and I first moved into our house, um, we rented a bobcat and to do some regrading around the house and all sorts of stuff. And the neighbor lady came over and she had a row of 10 honeysuckles along the lot line. And they were just horrible. They were, you know, just ratty and grass was growing in between them and they were just kind of a mess. And she said, could you pull those out with your machine? And we said, sure. Well, it had been, this was like in the spring. So, and that was right where her sump pump drained. So they were literally, we'd wrap a chain around the bottom and they'd go, as they came out of the ground. And I was the one wrapping the chain. So I was literally mud from head to toe when we got done. And it was, and she came over and she's like horrified looking at me like, that was like the most fun. <laughs> And then, the, then with that bobcat, the other thing we did is we dug our pond down the back. And we had um, Roxanne, our little beagle mix. And the geese were back there about by the pond after we had dug it. And it had filled up with water, but it was still just a mess from the machines running around it. And she ran out after the geese. And the geese flew off, and she put on the brakes and <laughs> slid yeah. and landed probably eight feet out into the pond. And she hated the water. And she came out and she probably had six inches of mud, because it's all clay, stuck to the bottom of her feet. And she didn't know how to walk. I was like, oh my gosh. It was very nice when we finally got grass, because our yard's a mess without it. <laughs> but, yeah. Anybody else got a good mud story? Well, just when I was a little kid, that side of the yard, you know, I thought I was planting seeds. And I when I took grass seeds, I was planting seeds and all that. I had a pumpkin I don't remember. So I was planting seeds and I was all excited and I came out the next day and I found out my brother had totally destroyed it and made a road for his car. <laughs> <laughs> I was just really ticked at ruined my mud, my, my, my garden. Your garden. <laughs> yeah, my favorite one is the football game we played against Racine Lutheran at Horlick Field in a weekend that had really been rainy. And uh, a semi-pro team had played before us. A high school team had played before us. And then we were playing Racine Lutheran in the afternoon. And you would slide for 6 8 feet <laughs> after you got tackled. And guys who typically didn't get in the game a whole lot, the coach would send in just so we could wipe our hands off on the <laughs> clean jersey. <laughs> it, it was, it was. Uh, my, my nephew played for Racine oh, Horlick when he was in high school, mm. and uh, Racine Lutheran, and they were playing at Horlick's Field. And they didn't have enough guys to play both, you know, some on offense and some on defense. Mm -hmm. You play both sides of the field, but it was raining, so the mud kept washing off. And I'm looking at him on the sideline, and he's literally in a mud puddle, rubbing mud on his uniform so it looks like he's done something. I'm like, Dan, what are you <laughs> doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why not muddy enough? The rain keeps washing up. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> the rain keeps washing up. <laughs> well, that's uh, uh, what belief lies be behind the disciples' question? That's uh, in verse 2. Who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? That he was, was, was being punished or something. And right? it's really like that God is a punishing. And what a horrible thing to think about a birth defect. Um, and one of the things I'm always cognizant of, I don't remember where I read this, but we're all defective, you know? All of us have, you know, different kinds of issues with our bodies. There isn't a perfect body any place that doesn't have some issues. And um, um, 
but here it was attributed to the to the parents. Now, uh, what is how does Jesus answer apply to this man, and how would this understanding of suffering apply to you? What does Jesus say? He says, "Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, he must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming." When no one can walk while I am in the world, I am playing the world. Okay, so how does that apply to, to him? What does it mean that the glory of God might be displayed in you? That God is going to use him to teach others. Yeah, he doesn't say who's caused the suffering. What he does say is God can use the suffering for a good purpose. If you think about some of the great stories of the saints, many of those great stories are people about people who have endured suffering. Um, people who endured suffering on account of the gospel, you know, and that's the, or just uh, endured suffering but remained faithful to God in spite of it. They didn't lose their faith. They still trusted that God loved them, that God cared for them, that he was there for them. And, um, and, and, and um, so it's this concept that can God display his glory in you when you go through suffering? Jesus doesn't address the idea of suffering here. He does in other places. Do sometimes we cause our own suffering? Obviously, if you don't eat the right things, get enough exercise, your body's going to suffer. You go to Florida for a month and sit in 75 degree and sunny weather every day and don't use sunscreen, sunscreen you're going to suffer. Mm -hmm. You know? Sometimes that suffering can come from our own attitudes, actions, and behaviors. That's true. Sometimes it can come just because, you know, we're in this world, which is broken. So we went down to have lunch uh, in um, our supper at, at uh, down in, what was this? Uh, not Siesta Key, when we went Cindy, that's uh, Fort Myers. And Jerry and I, we just said, well, let's just go down to Fort Myers Beach and see what it looks like. And she's got all kinds of pictures on her phone. I couldn't take pictures while I was driving, but. <laughs> We documented, you know, it's just crazy how much destruction is there. Now, did those people ask for it? Did they cause it to happen? No, it wasn't caused. It was caused because of the weather, you know. And, and so sometimes that happens. Or you think about COVID and the way that it, it, that it, it was passed around. It's an airborne disease. Now, uh, I, didn't do anything to, I didn't do anything to get it. I just happened to be around some airborne you know, germ that somehow got into my system. And sometimes I didn't know that I was, it's not like I put myself in a place of, and even people who were boosted and masked, they still got COVID. You do everything you can to prevent it and it still hits you. So sometimes it's just the brokenness of this world. Sometimes it is God. And in fact, in the book of uh, Isaiah, that's the problem, right? The people were unfaithful. God let down a protection, and they were taken away into captivity. God allowed that to happen. Um, you know, and, and and for their benefit is, is is the reason. But it's but here, what Jesus simply comments on is this: that any kind of suffering, regardless of where it comes from or why it comes, becomes an opportunity for us to. To be a light, um, a witness. A witness. Um, Bridge was just saying that last night about Gail. Everybody who walks into the room, they get a witness. <laughs> well, Dan was that way you know? too when he found out when he, he found out. Yeah, he became a total witness. You, you just, you have an opportunity in in those moments of suffering to be a witness to people who are around you and. The trouble is when you're going through the suffering, you're saying, isn't there an easier way to be? Why? Why? You ask a lot of whys. 
Now, why do you suppose that Jesus used mud here rather than healing just with his word? Who gave the answer last night? Well, I gave one answer last night, one possibility. It doesn't tell us, does it, exactly? But No, but it was, it was the best one I've ever heard. It was that it was a Sunday and he had to do some work, and that's why the Pharisees were so upset with him. I thought it was a great example yeah. of why he did that. Well, they would have been upset with him for healing, but the fact that he made mud meant that he was violating the okay. their law. Sabbath. They're a fair mm -hmm. Sabbath law. And once more, yeah, there are restrictions. And once more, Jesus demonstrates that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And what's, uh, what's really interesting here is that, from my perspective, is that they're more concerned about Jesus making mud that rather than celebrating that a blind man who had never been able to see could see. Sure yeah. I was a smart guy too, because he had a lot of good answers for the Pharisees. And that was that was that was amazing when they started questioning him because he just talked right back to him. Yeah, he <laughs> even though he didn't know who Jesus was, so um that's one reason. The, the other thing that, that people have pointed to is, is the sacramental nature of a physical something. I mentioned this last night too. Something physical attached to a promise or a word. Uh, so like, um, did God have to give us baptism in the Lord's Supper? Could he save us without those things? And the answer is yes. yes. Lord knows people were saved long before baptism in the Lord's Supper showed up. And even if you make circumcision somewhat akin to um, to baptism, as Paul compares it in his book of Colossians, um, even if you say, well, that's kind of a sacrament in the Old Testament, well, because there's a promise connected with the circumcision sign. Um, but that only started with Abraham. What about all the people who lived before that? And that only applied to men. What about all the women? Right? Um, so when you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about what the sacraments are, they're in addition to the word. Um, St. Augustine said that uh, bring the symbol, the sign, the physical reality to the word and you've got a sacrament. In other words, there's something that you see as well as, as an experience rather than just hearing it. And um, you can think about other things that are sacramental. You think, yeah. Bless you. Wow. Think about a wedding ring. Are wedding rings necessary? No? But it's a sign of a promise, a commitment. Right? Um, sometimes you might have got a special piece, especially women. Sometimes we'll get a special piece of jewelry from a mom or dad or somebody, you know. Or, um, and yeah, and it's something that's connected to uh, a promise. I know sometimes Jerry has some cards that we give sometimes to people who are exper have experienced a death. Um, what's that called that? The not have a little pin? A heart with a hole in it. A heart with a hole in it. And so again, just something to say, I care about you, I, mm -hmm. I love you, God's comfort is with you, and here's a reminder. It's a physical reminder of the... Well, it's like the ornaments at Christmas time, too. The ornaments I mean, at Christmas Because you don't know, you know, if you were to say something to a person at a restaurant or something, that might go in one ear and out the other. But every year at Christmas now, when they see that ornament, it's a reminder for it's them. It's a reminder for them. So, so is the sacrament, and so is, you know, and, yeah. and so putting mud on his eyes will kind of ingrain it in our feeble brains a little harder, maybe, that we remember a physical action. So the application questions here are, when have we, like the Pharisees, been more concerned about what we consider right rather than focusing on a need being met by a service like Jesus healing the blind man? Well, when you say we have to have a traditional service, not a contemporary service. I mean, or vice versa. Or we're, you know, we insist on a specific passion, you know, format. Format. Mm -hmm. Well, we do need red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first exception. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, really? Red carpet was the way to go, huh? Not that he was saying. 
<laughs> and everybody else says, but then we'd have to replace all the pew cushions. It's going to clash with the bowls at Christmas time. <laughs> Yeah, and what, what uh, shade of red is right, shade right. of <laughs> We went to a church up in Door County. Um, there's six of us, including Fred and Karen, and they had uh, a plaid. Oh, it was a Baptist church. And they had a plaid carpeting that had kind of a maroon in it. Um, yeah. And I said, Oh, Fred, is this good enough? No. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, you just, you think about any of the, um, the things where you're more concerned about doing something a certain way, and, and Judy's heard me say this often when it comes to Alter Guild stuff, not that I don't care, <laughs> but if it ain't in the Bible, I don't care. Mm -hmm. If it ain't in the Bible, then we're free to do what works for us. And, and, and so the question then is, how can I best in that way serve the people who are here? And we'll do those things, but, but where we dare not is when we say you must about something that God doesn't say you must about. In fact, in the Lutheran Confessions, there's a, uh, there's a, a particular uh, stance that uh, the reformers took when somebody said you must about something you should be saying you must about. And, and it's called instatu confessionis, in a state of confession. And what it means like this, if you say I have to, then I absolutely am not mm -hmm. going to do it. Because I want to, by my actions, say I'm free to do. Yes, I'm free to do that, but if you say I have to, then I'm going to step back and say, nope, I don't. Mm -hmm. Because by me saying, no, I don't, you're going to know that I don't believe that's something that God requires us to do. Yeah? So Chuck's Catholic. Yeah. So as long as we've been married, you know, he likes to try and eat fish on Fridays during Lent. And the other day, we were, his sister was over, and we were talking about it, and he made the comment that he'd, he'd gone out to, to lunch with a client, and the client insisted on taking him to this burger joint. It was a Friday, so he felt bad. And she says, well, you're over 60. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> the rule only applies until you're 60. There you go. And after you're 60, you can eat meat on Fridays. I'm like, you have got to be flipping <laughs> <laughs> I've been eating fish on Fridays for the last two years. <laughs> I think the Catholic Church gave, a, gave, I think here, gave a dispensation for this coming Friday. For, for St. Patrick's Day. Patrick's Day. Exactly. So they can eat corned beef. So they can eat corned beef. There you go. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing to me. <laughs> but I wanted to say something about yep. color because I was I was part of that group that went all the way down to um, St. Louis to order the pyramids. I was with that original group that did that. And one of the things we were we we were hesitant about was starting the blue because we always had purple. We never had the blue for right. Christmas. Right. Well, what we did was we we picked out the blue and kind of ordered it on the back burner so that we could go ahead, if, if we changed our mind, we could go ahead and order it. The question was, is that not going to match with the rug right, that we had? Carpeting, yeah. The carpeting. The mm carpeting, -hmm. which it doesn't, and who cares? Right. <laughs> but that was, that was yeah, the yeah. discussion yeah. on the carpeting. Well, somebody um, said something to me the other day because I had uh, seeking first and the uh, as uh, offering him, and of course it's got the word, Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, Pastor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Now nobody complained when Sharon had Hallelujah. Jesus has risen for the closing hymn for Todd's funeral. Right. Uh, good. And what I've always said to the people who say that, but when I do that once in a while on Sunday, I try to, I try to follow. You know, the rule. But, but no, but yeah, but some days, I, I, when somebody really gets on me about that, I'll just say, well, do you know the Sundays in Lent are not really a part of Lent? They don't count for the 40 days. Because every Sunday is supposed to be a little Easter. Uh -huh. So we could sing Hallelujah Sundays. Well, <laughs> not according to some people. And, and, and I, you know, I mean, back in the day, you couldn't get married during be baptized, but there were, the Catholic Church, that's another thing, is they don't do any baptism. 
baptisms. Baptisms during Lent. Lent. So that it's Sunday after Easter, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> They're all lined up, yeah. No, and those are the kind of man-made rules, and we just have to be careful that they don't get in the way of service, ministry, love to those people that God has called us uh, to serve. Um, so I'm going to just take one. Uh, have you ever been afraid of religious leaders? When I was a kid. <laughs> when I was a kid? You didn't want to get stared at when you fell asleep on Dad's shoulder during church. <laughs> I've known a few people who said, yeah, the pastor uh, called me out by name from the pulpit. <gasps> Yeah, I don't know that I've ever been afraid. No. I, I, my uncle was a pastor, and I remember as a little kid asking him why he always yelled at him in church. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was afraid. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, there, there, you know, I, um, I think... My experience is sometimes with people has been they're afraid to tell me the truth. They don't want to look bad in front of you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and. Never got rid of confession. <laughs> private confession. Yeah. Right. That's true. Actually. But just uh, it, it it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, to be honest, to be brutally honest with another person, and 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 yet. You know, the Bible says confess your sins to one another mm -hmm. that you may be healed. Um, yeah, I've, I've had people afraid. Um, and, and sometimes I, I've experienced it in other ways. Um, you know, I come back from a, a visit with a shunin who's in a, a senior care center of some kind and talk to their son or daughter and say, oh man, you know, mom is doing really good. She seems really happy. And they turn their head and say, are you talking to the same woman I'm talking to? Because they're not you know, like that with them. Because they're not like that with them. And, and, and if you think about it, very often, there are people that you're safe telling the truth to. And, and one of the things that I found very often is that uh, that's one of the reasons. They'll, they'll act like everything is wonderful to me, but then when their kid shows up, they got all kinds of complaints. But they're safe. Um, now the kid sometimes doesn't like it, because <laughs> they wish that they could have a conversation about something else than just the things that they're complaining about. And, um, but at the same time, it's, it, it, um, it can restrict that kind of free flow of, of care. So, um, so that's where we're going to stop today. Just realize you are part of the new Israel. You are God's servant. Um, what Israel was supposed to be and failed in the Old Testament, Jesus was perfectly when he came. And he sets us free to be now the light of this world for all in what we say, what we do, how we act and how we behave. Let's pray about that. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that where um, the nation of Israel failed as a servant of God, you fulfilled all of the, the potential of being a servant of God in this world. And you did it perfectly and then took our place on the cross as our suffering servant. We thank and praise you for having brought that light, that spiritual light into the eyes of our heart, that, uh, that you continue to shine in us through the power of your word, and we ask that you would bless us to notice the people that are around us that we have an opportunity to love and serve, that you make us aware of, of how and where we can be light 
is we continue to allow you to shine not only to us, but through us into the lives of others. Bless us to that end for your name's sake. Amen.